Napoleon resided here on the night of the 17th of June, 1815. It is this site on the breakfast conference in which Napoleon told his marshals, Wellington is a bad general, the English are bad troops, and this affair is nothing more than eating breakfast. A day after the battle, the Prussians, vowing that it should never happen again, harbor their former enemy, burnt the farmhouse. This is where the observation point occupied by Napoleon was when he returned to the battle at about 4 p.m. From here, looking northward, you can get the French view of the British lines across the valley about a mile away. These fields are on the eastern side of the site or where the first French infantry attack and the wild counterattack by the British cavalry took place. This road was here during the battle and crosses the body of the battlefield where the French cavalry and the Imperial Guard charges took place. And as you continue westward along the dirt road, you'll walk directly into across the battlefield. And you really need to envision this peaceful farmland of today as the field of horror and slaughter that it became that afternoon. The gentle ridge on the horizon of the Northwest was occupied by the British. Today from the valley, unchanged from the way it appeared to the French, the ridge conceals the ground behind it and this was enough to fool the Imperial forces in three separate attacks, thinking that the British had abandoned their positions. It is unquestionably the most significant feature of the battle site and the reason it was selected by Wellington. The Lion Mound is an ideal observation point from which to see the entire battlefield at once. Built in 1826, it involved the movement of over 106 million cubic feet of dirt, and the earth used to construct the Butte de Leon was taken by removing the ridge between uh, La Hessaint and the Butte's location. In other words, they took down the most important natural feature of the battlefield, the ridge, that caused Wellington to win in order to build a monument to his victory. The lion statue was cast in John Cockrell works at uh, Liège and his legend is that it was made from the melted down barrels of captured French cannons. Of course, it's just a legend. So we're going to go in, check out the museum, climb to the top and get some great views. So we're in the museum and they have this really great diorama of the battlefield behind us. This fortified farm formed the anchor point of the extreme southern end of the British defenses. The purpose of its defense by the British was to prevent the French from circling around through the low ground to the south and attacking their flank. Although this was the scene of intense combat all day, Hougemont never fell and fulfilled its role. The walls here behind me used to be higher and it used to have a solid wooden gate right over here these buildings and garden were defended by detachments of the Scots Guards and the Coldstream Guards. And although they were surrounded for most of the day, their musket, uh, their musket fire held the attackers at bay. And within these walls was some of the most tremendous violence of the battle. At one point, about a hundred Frenchmen broke through the main gate behind me and into this courtyard. But the defenders managed, the defenders managed to close it behind them. And there was a fierce fight in the courtyard and the only French unhurt survivor of the over 100 Frenchmen was a small drummer boy who had lost his drum. The great barn is here. To the right is, was the chateau connected to that chapel. And nothing really remains now of that, of that chateau uh, except with the wall piece that's attached to the, uh, to the chapel. It caught fire during the shelling and burned down during the battle, 
killing a lot of the, the wounded that were sheltered inside. And it's said that inside, we're gonna go check it out, inside the chapel hangs a wooden figure of Christ on, its cro uh, on the cross, and its feet still show charring marks from the flames that burned a lot of the wounded defenders that were stuck in there. So we're gonna walk around the rest of the, of the Hujamont farm and uh, see what we can find. So behind me is in this barn, they do a video uh, of the of the battle here at Hougamont, or at least a day. Uh, and it's probably the coolest thing I've ever seen as far as videos go or, 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 or videos presented at, at a museum. It's absolutely amazing. So if you come, you really got to check it out. This lane, the Chemin de Verte Bon, remains exactly the way it did when the infantry and artillery manned it. Except now it's been tarred and paved. And from here behind me, you can appreciate Wellington's strategy using the slope to screen his forces from the French coming up the valley. The cavalry and reserves were again behind this ridge line, down sloping ground to your, you know, right, right out here. And this is where Wellington had his mixed regiments of British, Belgian, Dutch, and German troops, ordering them back 100 yards from the skyline to lie down when the French artillery bombardment started. It's from this ridge line that they saw the immense waves of Imperial cavalry approaching from just beyond me at La Belle Alliance, across from the valley. And here they formed into squares in gallant defense against the equally heroic onslaught of cavalry charges. At about 7.30 p.m., the Imperial Guard attacked up this slope, unable to see their enemy until they were nearly at the top of the ridge. And then continuing northward about 300 yards from the Butte de Leon along the lane, we passed a, we passed a few stone monuments marking the crucial position of Royal Horse Artillery Company uh, under the command of Captain A.C. Mercier, and that battery played an important role in breaking up the French cavalry charges. And there's just, right over here, there's another stone that commemorates Lieutenant Augustine de Mulder, a cavalry lieutenant, and was killed here uh, in one of the furious charges led by Marshal Ney against the Allied lines. Here on the southwest corner stands a tree planted several years ago by the Touristic Federation of Brabant. And it's supposed to mark Wellington's observation post during much of the battle. It was near this spot at about 8 p.m. that Wellington raised his hat as a signal to all of his troops for a general attack on the Imperial forces, starting their total collapse. This tree was famous and it was brought, uh, bought by a shrewd Englishman, J.C. Children, in 1818. And he cut the tree up into small souvenir pieces were brought up by people eager to have a token of the victory of Waterloo. So this monument represents the actual height of the ridge line before it was tore down for the Butte de Leon monument. Today this all appears almost exactly as it did during the Battle of Wellington's Ridge as it ran right behind La Saint. It was awkward for Wellington to have his defend his fortress but it was so close to his lines that it could pose a serious problem to him if the French were able to take it. He posted a reliable detachment of 360 Hanoverians from the King's German Legion to defend it. When Napoleon saw the importance of this farm so close to Wellington's lines and he set his French infantry to attack it at about 3 p.m. The farm was surrounded and French broke through the main gate. They were slaughtered and the attack was repulsed but many of the defenders were also killed. At about 6 p.m. the French made a second attack. The Hanoverians stood on the roofs of the sheds and leaned over the walls, firing their last few rounds. But the French got onto the roofs of the opposite stables and fired down into the courtyard. With their ammo gone, the Hanoverians had to abandon their position. But the only way out was to fight their way through the house and out by the back gate after a brief, horrific fight in the courtyard with musket butts and bayonets. Only 41 of the 306 Hanoverians made it back to the crossroads alive. This small stone monument is dedicated to Lieutenant General Sir Thomas Picton, who was shot dead on his horse here while commanding the Scottish infantry against the first French attack. Cameroon Highlanders, the Black Watch, the Gordons, and the First Royal Scots, all regiments of Sir Thomas Picton's infantry division, fought despite having already lost over a third of their men in the previous day's battle at Quatrebois. Nearby is a stone monument commemorating the 27th Innis Killing Regiment and as you look south, you can see the entire open plain 
over which the first French infantry attack came, which was also the scene of the disastrous British Cavalry Regiment. 